Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Philip Kern from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he is an, uh, a professor in the School of Informatics there, uh, basically chair of machine translation. He got his PhD in machine translation from USC. Uh, he, uh, his advisor was uh, Kevin Knight. Um, I, I consider him uh, a leading light in the uh, MT field. Um, uh, he is best known for the open source decoder Moses, uh, which is widely used within the research community and as well as in the um, uh, in commercial enterprise as well. It's uh, it's basically uh, kind of the go-to for a lot of uh, a lot of research and and, and commercial work. Um, uh, Philip directs a, a fairly large and productive MT team at the at the University of Edinburgh, and has uh, graduated a number of students over the past few years. Uh, two of whom I think are coming today. I don't see either one of them, but uh, <laughs> they they said they were coming. <laughs> uh, uh, Michael and Abhishek. Uh, so uh, they'll probably be here shortly. Um, he uh, has led or leads uh, or plays a principal role or a key role in a number of research projects within the EU, a number of uh, EU-funded projects, as well as uh, uh, two DARPA-funded projects. Um, it's actually, uh, he and I were talking at AMTA, I was uh, asking about uh, some of his uh, uh, recent awards. And, and those of you who have actually applied for grants, if you if you get one out of six funded, you're doing really well. And this year alone, Philip has managed to get three out of five, which is a phenomenal record if you consider. The only, the only drawback of that is you end up having all the management responsibilities of having three grants funded when you were hoping for one. <laughs> um, so uh, Philip also uh, manages the statmt.org site, which uh, a number of people in the MT field actually have gone to to get data or information about MT. He also runs uh, with uh, Chris Callison Birch and a number of other people the workshop on machine translation, which is uh, co-located uh, with ACL or EMNLP every year. Uh, a, a rule actually calls the uh, WMT the uh, the Grammys of of the, the MT world. I think you've called it that, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, we, we we welcome the Grammys uh, uh, MT guy here, uh, Philip Kern. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I I don't have as many jokes as at the Grammys. So sorry. <laughs> um, so I want to give a bit of a talk about uh, work we have done in computer aided translation. So this is a bit of a shift in our research uh, where we finally look at who is actually using machine translation. Um, so I have way too many slides, so I'm not going to get through the talk anyway. <laughs> so um, please interrupt me as much as you can. Um, I, I try to give a version of this talk at ISI and we got to about one third. And that, I would consider that a success. Um, so yeah, please ask me many questions about uh, this work. Um, as Will already kind of alluded to, uh, this was also the basis for some of the funding we asked for from the European Union. Um, so we have two research projects on this very topic. <laughs> That's one of the things for you. You would have hoped, hoped to have one research project, but now we have two, which oh, makes two, us a... <laughs> no, no, on this particular topic. There are other stuff too. Yeah, this is just the start <laughs> of it. Um, uh, where we uh, committed to build open source toolkit for computer aided translation and work with translation agencies. So this has been something I've been pursuing for the last two or three years, and now it's definitely going to get full steam ahead. So I'll talk a bit more about the work we have already done and a little bit about the plans there. OK, so just to set that up a bit in a broader context, why are we doing machine translation? Um, so the majority of the research focus in the States has been on assimilation. So the idea that someone wants to have some kind of information that's only available in foreign text. So you do a Microsoft Bing search for some technical term and you only get a Chinese web page back. And you want to know what's written in it. And if you get it translated, and it's, it's garbled and it's not necessarily the best translation, but you get your information out of it, you're happy. So this is a scenario where the user is relatively tolerant of not perfect quality. And this has been the focus of DARPA-funded research, where the scenario is some analyst wants to find out 
some document that's written in Arabic or Farsi or Pashto and kind of see where that is going. Um, another application is um, um, communication where you maybe have a multilingual chat application where people talk to each other and that has the advantage that if something gets mistranslated you can always ask follow-up questions. So there's also some uh, room for error in terms of um, machine translation quality. So been, this is somewhat connected with speech recognition research. There's always this idea of a handheld device. You travel abroad to China or Japan and you have a handheld device so you can actually ask for directions. So things like that. Um, so and the final application is dissemination where you actually have a lot of text in your own language and you want to actually have that published in other languages. And then you can basically push these translations onto unsuspecting civilians out there who don't know how it was produced and they're not going to be happy if they're errors. Um, and this is kind of where the action is in terms of money being spent on translation. Money is being spent on high quality publication level uh, translation. And this is currently done pretty much by human translators. This is not done by machine translation. So this is what I try to focus on since this is kind of, especially in the European context where the goal for machine translation is to deal with this situation that the European Union has 23 official languages and they're going to have one more, they're going to have 24 official languages because Croatia is going to join next year and it's just gonna, not going to go away and people in Denmark are not going to stop speaking Danish and they will expect all the EU level laws that apply to them to be published in Danish and so on. So kind of if you can't beat human translators at producing publication quality translations, join them. So um, I started this out with the question like how can we actually help human translators which kind of leads to the question what do they actually do? How do human translators actually, what are actually the hard problems for them? So why don't they just write the translation? I mean, what stops them and what slows them down? So building an MT tool kind of then um, has to kind of be geared towards the biggest problems in human translation. Okay, so I'll talk a bit about um, uh, human translation, about uh, how we can then assist human translators and so we build a tool um, for human translators and we are going to talk about this in a user study. And the last two topics, I'm not sure if I'm going to get to. Uh, one is the extreme case of a human translator who doesn't know the source language at all. Um, so a monolingual translator. And at the end, uh, some work on uh, integration with translation memories. But I don't think I'm going to get to that. So um, I'll start with a study. Um, we wanted to find out how human translators work. So what do we do? We just get a bunch of human translators and observe them really closely. Um, so we did that at a university. What do we do at a university? We just hire students. Um, so we did French-English because it's a language pair where MT is pretty good and uh, we could get access to quite a few people who speak French in, at the University in Edinburgh. So they were French natives who studied in Edinburgh and then they are, um, French is one of the languages that they that is somewhat popular in England and Scotland to learn. So we have also uh, English speakers who learned some high school French, or at least claimed they knew French. So we offered the money and they said, yeah, I know French. And we said, yeah, you hired. Um, okay, and that's, that's actually good. Some of them we didn't actually know French all that well. So, but that's an interesting data point too. How well do they do? Okay, so uh, we translate, each of the students then translated news stories. Um, uh, from French to English, uh, about 40 sentences. Um, it's a pretty easy task. So this is some context they have, um, content they're familiar with. It's just the news of the day. Um, there's no specialized technology, terminology. So if you, for instance, translate Microsoft manuals, then you need to know what mouse click means in French. And it's not necessarily a literal translation. So you need to know all these terminology. So we didn't have those kind of problems. And we locked exactly which key they typed at which point and how the translation looked like at this point. So we had a really good view of how they produced their translations. 
Um, so here's an example how that looks like with the, with the data we get out of this. Um, it's a bit of a challenge actually how to visualize that and what information you want to get out of it. So I'll get over it a bit. So this is the keystroke log. Um, so the input, I think there's one character got lost in the, in the LaTeX format. So this is a French sentence and this was then the translation that was produced. The manufacturer has delivered 97 planes during the first half. And this is the keystroke lock. So it goes over the time axis here, 0 seconds to 35 seconds. Uh, the height of these bars is how long the sentence was at that point. And the color of the bars indicates what kind of keystroke was done. So the black ones are just the regular letter character was being typed. Um, the purple ones was when the delete key was hit. And the grayish ones that you may or may not be able to see are cursor movements. So what happened here? For three seconds, nothing happened, or at least nothing observable happened. Then this person started to type happily along, bit of a hesitation here, up to 10 seconds. Then three seconds of thinking, uh, some reflection. Uh, deleted some characters, uh, typed something, moved the cursor around, then started typing again, deleting something again, and then just kept typing for quite a while with a bit of a break here. And then at the end, apparently here the translation was pretty much done, the cursor was moved around, uh, something more, some characters were deleted, some characters added. So we actually have a, this is one way to visualize it. You actually don't know how the translation looked like at each of these points, but it's hard to kind of, how do you actually show that in a nice graph? Um, so in one of the research projects we're currently doing on, we actually have a replay mode. We can run the entire interaction and you can actually see exactly what happened at each point, um, including eye tracking, so you can actually also see whether people looked at the screen. Uh, but at, at the point of this study, we didn't have that. We just have the key log. Uh, but we have an exact, we could actually do the replay. We couldn't, we know which character was typed here, how the translation looked at here. So if you want to visualize that too. So for the division, you mean obviously the last one, if there's no cursor of more? Probably. The user could also use the mouse. So this is just a web interface, so you can just do anything. But yeah. So you don't know the mouse movement here? We don't know the mouse movement. We know, yeah, we don't know the mouse movement. Well, you have it recorded, you just don't yeah. have it displayed. In this kind of we, have, we don't have the mouse movements. Okay. Because it's just, a, so this is a web interface, right. so mouse movements don't really mean all that much. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, you could reposition this in the cursor. So we don't know where the cursor position is at each time. But if a keystroke happened, we know how the translation looked before and how it looked afterwards. So we can reconstruct where the keystroke happened. So we record at each given point here, yeah, each, each, key, each event we log, um, what kind of key was pressed, how the translation looked at at this time, but not where the cursor was in the, in the input. I thought we could maybe do that, but it's, it's kind of, it follows from the keystroke. Um, and it's a web, so you could also do cut and paste actually, but like control C, control E. But I don't think people have done that. I was yeah. thinking about that. Do you think that you would have gotten different results if you had used professional translators? Because Probably, yeah. So we've, yeah, we've looked into that much more. In, uh, in, yeah. So one group we work with in one of these European projects has been doing translation studies. Uh, translation process study is the official term. So you actually study translators and what they do. And there is a, there is a difference. Um, I think the most striking ob uh, intuitive or whatever apparent one is how much of the input text do you read before you start translating. So if you have a, if you have a fresh translator, they are all trained to first read the entire sentence and then start translating. And if you actually look at professional translators, they don't do that anymore if they've done it for five years. <laughs> they forgot all the good lessons they learned in school. Just they see the first three words and start typing. Uh, yeah, there's definitely a difference in speed, obviously, and, and the kind of pauses. I'll have a bit about this because we have different types of users in this study, so we, we get into this. You have another question? If, if, if you 
if your goal was to look at dissemination and publication quality yeah. and how human translation is done there, why did you even bother with doing a study with people that weren't professional translators? Um, because we had them available partly and because we basically started building a tool I mean, there's still bilingual speakers who can translate, but it's not well, yeah, to the level of professional that's translators. Where things differ because yeah. bilingual isn't necessarily a good professional translator. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm not claiming that. I'm not claiming that at all. Um, we also have a bit of a broader focus than just uh, professional translators. So the other idea is um, so that I'll get, I'm not sure if I get to the extreme case of a monolingual translator who doesn't know the source language and just wants to use the tool like this to maybe better decipher the foreign document. But we also want to use this in kind of volunteer translation communities. So there's a bunch of communities on the web who translate stuff for fun to produce content in their own language. Um, there's like quite a few groups in China that translate news stories into Chinese from the BBC or The Guardian that was even officially sanctioned by The Guardian. And there's another website we've started or try to collaborate with, Global Voices, where people are like amateur journalists and translate this kind of material. So yeah, we're a bit broader than just... Um, I think the point, um, what's consistent in them is, yeah, they all have the goal to produce correct translations that are at least amateur level quality, opposed to just raw and tea. Yeah. So you don't like the translation thing either. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll have another slide with all kinds of translations, and then uh, I'm, I'm interested about your feedback on that. Um, yeah, so the question is who uses this, and it's not just the professional translators, also the ones. But yeah, the, the, where the money is, is obviously professional translators, how you can help them. And they have higher standards about what they expect. OK. Um, um, yeah. So a uh, so bit more analysis. What can you get out of this? So you can observe that people type, maybe slow or fast, and they make pauses. And I can, that's kind of where the action is. So what are the pauses they make, and how many pauses do they make? So they make a pause at the beginning, where they read the sentence, and they might make a pause at the end, where they review the sentence and decide do they like the translation or not. And then there's also different types of pauses, so it's a bit hard to kind of then break that down. So if it's a short pause of maybe two to six sec sec seconds, they just might just not entirely sure about what the next word is, but it's just somewhat a hesitation. If it's a medium pause, up to a minute, they're really solving some problem, maybe rereading the source sentence, maybe reading their translation. There's something a bit more uh, bigger that is kind of causing them to pause that long. And then there are pauses of longer than 60 seconds. Do you have any information about what they did during the pauses? In this study, we don't. And we're very, very bothered by that. So the, the work we're doing now also does eye tracking. So we at least know where they look at at the screen. So we are. So if you have a pause, that I mean, that was kind of one of the thing that kind of left us puzzling after this. So if there's a pause of like two minutes, what are they doing? <laughs> There's a good chance of that. Looking up a strange word. Yeah, looking up a strange word. Yeah, I don't know. Do they look at a dictionary? I mean, that's a big question. That, and that's kind of, yeah. Actually, I've done uh, translations myself, so I can probably uh, give some feedback on this one. So, uh, short pauses. Um, like two to six seconds to check the suggestions from the translation memory. Okay. Uh, there might be fuzzy matches, mm -hmm. which means basically that instead of retyping the whole sentence uh, from scratch, you can actually recycle mm -hmm. the suggestion. And so we didn't have translation memories in here. Sorry? Just, this is just translation from scratch without any. Okay. Okay. But, but anyway. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway. Um, the second thing, uh, terminology uh, check. So basically, if there is a term, you need to make sure that it's translated consistent with glossaries or whatever requirements there are. Also verifying consistency with previous translation of the same term. It can take just a few seconds for that. Yeah. And all passes, if you don't know a certain term, it can take minutes basically to, uh, to make sure that you're using it correctly. Or yeah. You know that what basically to choose. That's my experience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, since you're here, maybe I should ask you then. I ask that a lot of translators. So what takes actually then the most time? 
Wait, what takes them the most time in your translation? I would say terminology. Terminology. So when you don't know exactly what term to use, mm -hmm. um, that takes a lot. But sometimes uh, checking grammar, like uh, comma yeah. cases, maybe, you know, um, there's some language, it depends on the language, but there might be some moves that require you to go into some uh, resource uh, verifying yeah. whether you need a comma here or not. Yeah. So that's probably the two biggest, I'll say. Okay, great. Named entities, yeah. checking, getting the name of your customer, getting the name of your customer in this department, right? Okay. So, I mean, that all kind of directs yeah. into what kind of tools should you build, and, and these are all things where, where, where we could build. You know, very Do you have any information? Well, in the sentence, uh, do they pause? Is there, or always in the, in the beginning of a new clause? Or it's a um, we do have that information. I don't analyze now where that pause happened temporarily, besides I make the distinction between beginning and final pauses. Mm -hmm. But we have all the data. And actually, I posted all the data for this on the web. And, and if you want to dig into deep, it's, it feels like this is like you have a massive amounts of data. You have like every keystroke that happened and when it happened down to the microsecond and how do you actually, what kind of questions do you have and kind of how we can actually get a kind of, you always have this one number answer for everything and <laughs> you have like millions of numbers, how do you, how do you distill that? It's not entirely obvious. Exactly. Sometimes I will uh, be using a sign I know was wrong because uh, just to move along here and keep the flow of the sentence. When then, actually, that's never what I meant to say. And I back up and I want to correct that sign just that it's more idiomatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also, I mean, I guess sign language translation is then very similar to simultaneous translation where you have to translate speech while it happens. and. That's a bit of a different scenario, but it's, yeah. People do, do those kind of translations very differently. Like they don't change word order much because they have to kind of spit out the words when they come in and they can't, <laughs> can't wait much. So um, here they have more time to think. They don't have to do it real time. They have to, <laughs> um, they usually take more time to produce a translation than you would spend you on just talking word. it. We, we didn't pay them, yeah, we paid them es essentially by the word here, so we just gave them a flat amount of money for translating all these sentences. But as a professional translator, you know, the more you do, the more you get paid, so you have an incentive. Yeah, to yeah. so the incentive is here clearly to be fast yeah. uh, also, so that makes sense. You don't pay them by the hour. Okay, um, yeah, um, here's a big table where, where time was spent. Um, okay, that's a lot of numbers, I'll, I'll go. Gently over those. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> don't have to memorize all of them. Um, before I get to that, um, so we have these different, we group the translators in two different groups, the ones that are native French and the ones that are native English. Um, in a professional translation scenario, the standard thing is you translate into your native language. So you need to know the language you're translating into. and The, the, the language you translate out of it is the one you learned in school or whatever. And so we have here the L1s that are the ones that are native French. So these are the ones you wouldn't normally hire. And the L2s are the ones that are native English. Um, the total time is the time per word. Um, another standard way to measure this is how many words per hour. So yeah, it was kind of on the inverse of each other. So these are on average, people would translate between 500 and 1,000 words per hour, which is relatively fast for, by, by professional translation standards. How much? 500 to 1,000 words per hour. That's, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. Without yeah. translation memories, it's or three yeah. to four times as much as well. Yeah, but it's also news, so it's not difficult. So the, all the terminology that you brought up, it's not necessarily a problem here, because there's no fixed terminology to how to say Secretary of State or... Languages like German uh, words are not used as a measure measure of uh, productivity. They use lines because words are combined. Yeah. Do characters then? Use it with other languages yeah. as a measure. Yeah. So this is uh, yeah number of source words you translated. This is what we divide the total time by. Do um, so you see some variance? So the fastest ones are 2.8 seconds. So these are really fast. This is more than a thousand words per hour and the slowest one was 7.7 .7 seconds. Um, so then we try to allocate the time on activities. Uh, and we had like these different types of pauses and keystrokes. And 
If you're really strict about it, a keystroke doesn't take any observable time. Press the key and that's it. That's not, <laughs> that doesn't even take a second. That takes just <laughs> no time at all. It's just a point in time. So the way we define this is whenever there's a keystroke, the second before and the second after is part of the typing activity. So we do kind of break down all these typing activities and only if there's no activity for at least two seconds, so it's not part of an ending interval of typing and the beginning interval of typing, then this time in between there is part of a pause. So this is how we then define these intervals. So there's a typing period, then there's a pausing period, there's a typing period, there's a typing period. Okay, um, and then based on these intervals, we can then allocate how much time was spent on each of these activities. And you normalize all those numbers by the number of words in yeah, the sentence. Yeah, so you, you, you just measure all these times, and then you just at the end, just, just to make it kind of numbers, you can compare. And so if you have these total time spent on the first translator, 3.3 seconds per word, this is kind of how it breaks down and where they spend all this time. So let's just go over that. Um, so. Um, not much time was spent by these translators on the final pause. So once they were done with the translation, they were happy and moved on. They didn't spend now a lot of time rereading it. Um, they didn't spend much time on these short pauses, these two to six seconds. And they also were not really all that different on how much time they were typing. So there were not big difference between slow typers and fast typers. Um, the big differences between the translators were um, how much they paused, so, the medium time and long time pauses. Especially the big pauses, you see one, some translators who didn't have any big pauses at all. They never paused for more than 60 seconds. They just always kept typing. And, and the second translator was probably the worst translator in terms of speed, spent two seconds per word on big pauses. So this is where they the good and the bad translators kind of differ. Um, how much do you have to think about the whole thing? <laughs> do you have a corresponding table for the quality of the output? We'll get to quality, yeah. yeah we'll get to that. Um, that was a concern. And, uh, and yeah, so I've, I've, I'll, I'll break this down a bit more in the next 10, 20 minutes. Uh, the usual productivity for translators is considered about 250 to 300 words per hour. So the second translator is actually pretty much within both that uh, real, you know, boundaries. So the, the, all, everybody else seems to be translating much faster than the normal yeah. Uh, yeah. translation through is. Yeah. yeah, so 300 words per hour is 12 seconds per word. Yeah, so 7 and 7 So these are all pretty fast, yeah. Um, again, um, question is how good is the quality and how, how difficult is the task. So I think the task is not that hard. So when I do this to my to a quality level to my satisfaction, I get similar speed because it's news, there's not it's much specialized um, vocabulary and so on. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll skip this one here. You can also have a graph like this where you kind of track how much time was spent on the pauses of a certain length, but it's going to take two. If you, if you, get, this, <laughs> if you get this formula here, <laughs> you just accumulate, you kind of add longer and longer pauses and then see how much total time was spent. You get, you get something out of it. Um, so this is a person who spends a lot of time. So it's not really much slower if you just consider short pauses than the bulk, but spends a lot of time on these long, long pauses. Um, it's just a pretty colorful graph, but yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. How do you actually visualize this? So this rather arbitrary distinction into like up to six seconds is this, up to 60 seconds is something else, um, somewhat questionable. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dig in a little bit more into all these numbers, but I first go to the main point of all this work was to how to build type systems that assist human translators. And then I'll dig more about uh, how they were helped and how much time they spent, the quality of the translations, all that. Uh, maybe a uh, spoiler alert, the quality dif dif didn't differ too much. No, I'll get back to that. <laughs> so quality is an issue, um, and we'll get back to that. And the translators differed in quality, yeah, let's say that. Okay, so we um, tried two different types of assistance. Um, one um, is sentence completion, which is kind of an auto-suggest kind of facility. So the, the translator types in a translation, 
and the tool makes suggestions. The next word should be this, next phrase should be this. And the user can just accept this, and then it just produces a translation. Um, so it's one phrase at a time. So what does phrase here mean is, if you know phrase-based MT, that's what we mean. So these are short n-grams that are used by the phrase-based model. So there's a reflection about how the phrase-based model uh, produced the translations. And so it just spits out these phrases out of the phrase-based model. Um, translation options is also something very closely tied to the way the phrase-based MP system works. So it, it gives suggestions for single words and phrases and uh, ranks them. I'll have a visualization of that. And the third one is kind of the default. If you don't do anything smart about integrating MT, you just give the human translators the MT translation at the beginning and say, fix it up. So this is kind of creeping its way into research, in the, into the industry where translators get increasingly confronted with, instead of translating from scratch or from translation memory, now fix up MT output. And they're not necessarily happy about this. Um, so um, this is actually in, in a tool that is online. You can try it yourself. Um, um, so this was developed in Ruby on Rails and Ajax. 2.0 and all kinds of web 2.0 and MySQL and PHP. Uh, and no, this was written in Ruby. And its backend is a Moses machine translation engine. So you can actually go to the website and try it out. Um, the browser compliance is not as good as I <laughs> would have hoped at this point. Um, it works best on Firefox on a Mac, but <laughs> some of the t formatting of things don't work. But I'll, I'll, I'll demo it a bit later. It's just probably a few things I should fix up. Um, we're not going to build this tool much further because in the new research projects, we collaborated with other groups who also had their tools. So we decided to just start off from scratch and build a new tool. So, but it, it is as it is for now. OK, so this is how, um, on a very, very short sentence, just a headline, um, this sentence prediction looks like. So you have in green the input sentence, so the headline of this new story. You have a text box. That is an orange. Um, it's just a regular um, HTML text area. You can do whatever you want in a text area. Um, and you have a suggestion there of what the next word should be. So this is not really super rocket science here. It just <laughs> comes up with Newman. You can just type that, and you're going to make the next suggestion. Um, so the user accepts this by pressing tab. Or they can just type in their own translation. So if they type in a different word, the, the tool kind of thinks about it again and makes a new suggestion. Um, so this, there was a project 10, 10 years ago, TransType, uh, done by Canadians and some Xerox research and some other groups in Europe that came up with this originally. Um, and there's some people who kind of kept this strand of research alive, although it really never really made a huge breakthrough. And we are now kind of try to revive it a bit. OK, so how does this work? Um, so the, we first run the input sentence through the machine translation engine, and we create the search graph. So we have the entire search space that was explored by the machine translation decoder. And we try to match what the user typed in against the search graph. You could also just rerun the machine translation with this prefix, but that would be too slow. So this is something where you actually don't want to wait at all. So if the user types, types in, some characters, you really can't even wait a large fraction of a second. So it has to be really, really fast to come up with new suggestions. So there can't be really much of a wait period. If it takes a second, that's too slow already. So running the MT engine wouldn't have been a able. We wouldn't have done that with our kind of machine translation engine back in the day. Um, so that's why we operate on the search graph. So going over the search graph is much faster. Um, so yeah, so it's a. Um, there are two criteria. We want to find the minimal edit distance matched to what the user typed in. So we might not have what the user typed in in our search graph. Then we want to find something that has a minimal string edit distance. That's the number one criteria. If we have multiple paths for the same minimum string edit distance, we take the highest scoring path, so the highest probability path. Um, so the search graph is pre-computed and stored in a database. Uh, matching is done on a server, and the browser kind of makes these requests. Uh, 
typically takes less than a second. Yeah, usually it's much faster than that, and so on. Um, I could, at some point, I'm going to demo this. And let me just go through all these things that you're going to see on the screen before that. OK, that was number one. Number two was the translation options. So you have the same input sentence here, and you display, you display the top translations according to the model. Um, and it shows you word translations and phrase translations kind of mixed up. So f the top line is the word translations and then the phrase translations. And the user can just click on these. So you don't have to retype them. You just click on all this, and you can build your whole translation by clicking. Um, how does that work? It also it works basically heavily on the phrase based MT system as a phrase translation table. And we score these phrase translations with the, uh, not only the translation probabilities, but also estimate of the language model cost for all of them. So it's a lot like the future cost estimation in, in phrase-based MT, where you try to figure out what are the easy part of the sentence or the hard part of the sentence, so your search doesn't get lost and does only the easy part first, because that looks kind of most promising. So it's kind of the outside, it's very similar to the outside cost estimation. OK, this is how the tool looks. Um, so let me try. This is a really big screen, so this is actually not going to work pretty nicely. Um, so this is how it looks for a French sentence. That is very short, but it actually you now fits perfectly on the screen. So you have on the left uh, the source. Then green is the sentence I'm currently translating. In the middle is just for information the raw MT output. And on the right is what you already translated, although I just deleted the translation. So you kind of build up this part here. It's probably not the best way to structure this and be doing it differently in the new tool we built. Um, but the main thing is down here. So you have the source sentence. You have the string edit distance to the post editing. And you have here the text box. So here it proposes that you start with Sarkozy and can just say Sarkozy at the meeting of Fisherman Angry. OK, that's not a great translation, but you kind of see how these things kind of came up. If you want to actually do something different, so maybe at the meeting, this, I don't know, any other suggestions? Anybody know French? At the meeting, maybe with angry, and then hopefully it proposes fisherman. Oh, yeah, it does. So you kind of see how it, you know, like you look not happy well with the translation. Oh, just meeting. And then it should say angry fisherman. No, it doesn't. Oh, maybe I should then hear demo what happens when you click on something. You can click here on angry, pop, and it pops in. It's somewhat smart about uh, uh, uppercasing the first word of a sentence and just ad adding commas and periods and all that, but it's not super perfect. Angry fisherman, and then it's done with that. Yeah. Right, or well, I can start directing. So you can do whatever you want, <laughs> but the, the, the prediction is set up that you do it left to right. So you can, it's a text area. You can just, if you want, you can just type fisherman. And then you can go whatever you want. You can move your mouse, you can even cut and paste things. And <laughs> I mean, you can do what you want. <laughs> so you can use the tool. It doesn't hinder you from any way you want to use the tool, it doesn't force you in any kind of operation. But yeah, to make to get benefits from the prediction, I don't know what happens now here. Yeah, it's of course a bit, <laughs> a bit lost. Um, yes, yeah, so you actually see the shaded out uh, versions. This is what the machine translation system thinks you have currently translated. So you th it thinks you already translated Sarkozy with that first scribbly stuff here. Assume you produce this. Yeah. Sequence. So it has to come up with some idea about where this, what I kind of cut and paste there, this error map. Where did that come from? And its best hypothesis is it got Sarkozy wrong and error is the right word, so it's a substitution. So there's a string edit distance one to the search graph. There's no way, you have to do something with that. So it's going to be an error of one to the search graph because you have a new word, an unknown word in there. So it has to come up with the best explanation, which in this case probably is substitution with Sarkozy. OK, um, so this is a lot of fun. Um, back to the talk. Um, 
Yeah, so the final thing is post-editing MT. There's not really that much to say about it. So you just get in your text area, already pasted in the MT output, and you can fiddle with it any way you want. And in this bluish area, it gives you uh, kind of a visualization of the string edit. So you kind of see which words you deleted and which words you inserted. Um, so this is a sentence, yeah, corrected with a few things. So it's a, it's the MT output had, it, had him as an interpreter. An actor is probably a better word in English. And it, there was also years in there, and it mistranslated the name of the title of the movie. Because I guess in French, it's just called Le Kit, and not the Sundance Kit. So you have to get the proper English title. OK. Um, so, um, so we have the same setup here now. Uh, so we have 10 uh, translators. And actually, the study I've reported earlier was just part of this study. So we actually didn't do the first study as a separate study. It's just <laughs> we have the, had them translate these 40 sentences under different conditions. And one of them was without any assistance. Um, same people. Um, and we have five different conditions. The unassistant is what I originally talked about. So they didn't have any help at all. They just had the text area, and that's it. Nothing else on the screen. Just the source sentence, obviously. Um, the second, uh, the first thing we tested is the prediction. So this is what I mostly demoed with making suggestions. Um, the options where you can just click on all these words or both of these things. And the fifth condition was post-editing. So they just had the output of the MT, and they could fix it any way they wanted. And uh, so they had blocks of 40 sentences under each condition, and each translator did them. And we rotated things around that each text block was translated under all of the different conditions by different translators. Obviously, no translator translated the same block twice <laughs> under different conditions, because they would have known already too much about it. Um, so we are concerned about quality. We are mostly concerned here about speed. Uh, we want to have faster translators. We, we don't necessarily want to have worse translators. Um, so we thought we're going to just do a very simple quality assessment where we just ask them afterwards, judges, saying, is that a right translation or not? Uh, because you thought these are human translators, they should be 90% right. <laughs> um, didn't turn out that way. So we just asked them, you know, is that a fully fluent and what is the word here, wording here? Fully fluent and meaning equivalent translation of the source. It sounds like a straightforward question. And we showed it also in context. So if, if there was some confusion about, you know, what you know, pronouns refer to and so on. You could figure that out from the context. OK. Um, to our surprise, we got about 50% correct. And I'll show you a slide with one sentence. And we can then argue about if the judges are too harsh, which was my impression, or all our translators are actually really crap. <laughs> uh, there were some of the same students and other students who did then the judging. Yeah, it's just also non-professionals. OK, so just to give you one example. So you have a quality judged by the same guys who produced? Yes. What different sentences? Some of them, yeah. We, we had a mix of people, but there was some overlap between the two groups, yeah. So they, they didn't know who produced which translation. Maybe they recognized their own translation. Maybe not. So the groups could over. They could be reviewing their own translation. They could have reviewed, yeah. So they were actually given, let's see how we did this. I think we showed them all the 10 translations, like here, from the different translator on different conditions. And they had to say about each one, is it correct or wrong? So yeah, yeah, it's, there's a concern if they see their own translation, they say, that's the one that's right, and everything else is rubbish. Yeah. It's, it's but we are judging the right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sorry. Uh, I'm not going to go down that road. Anyway, so, <laughs> so here's a sentence. Um, so uh, this maybe it's somewhat French sentence. Uh, it startled the MT system, which came up without dismantle. It has been concise and accurate. So this without dismantle is kind of the biggest struggle here, and how to get that right. Um, and these are the different translations you see here. Who did it? Um, again, the L1s were the ones who are French native. And the L2s are the ones that are English native. And these are the different assistants. Um, the first striking observation that is always stunning is these people were very much prompted 
by the MT system, by them showing them translation options, they had a very kind of similar kind of <laughs> mindset on how they should translate the sentence. And they all came up with very different translations. So <laughs> if you give 10 people a sentence to translate, they all come up with different translations, even for a short sentence like this. And in the, even this scenario, where two of them are just post-editing from the same source, and others were shown like all these options, and they all <laughs> were kind of primed towards certain vocabulary to use and, and all that, and they're still all so, what, what is different. a good translation? I mean, I don't know. Oh, yeah. That's, so uh, my impression, so um, it, just to finish the description of this slide, the first number is in green how many thought this was a correct translation, and the red is how many thought it was a wrong translation. So what's... <laughs> Um, let's start with the third one. Without fail, he has been concise and accurate. Is that a good? That was the first one that three people thought was not a good translation. But I don't know French, but just from the general context of the article, I thought that was actually not a wrong, bad a translation. I mean, if our MT system would produce that, we would be perfectly happy. But um, without getting flustered, he showed himself to be concise and precise. Everybody liked that one. Um, yeah, sometimes, yeah, it's human judges also, so you have this here. He showed himself concise and precise, so this first weird thing was just lobbed off. <laughs> <laughs> and two people said, yeah, that's all just redundant, it doesn't mean anything. So the, the native speakers were, na yeah, native French, French speakers, and, yeah. and then, but how good was the English of the native French speakers? Um, so they were university students in Edinburgh, so... I mean, the, the English was good enough to um, attend university classes, so it's not... Taking English lessons? No, they're, they're just regular students at the university, so they're not taking English lessons. Just I, can, I, can, I can enroll in university and take, take yeah. lessons at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, I mean, here's the output, so you can judge. I mean, some of these, all the, uh, I think the L1s are the ones that were produced by the French natives, so you can... So is there problems with grammar? There's also always, you know, effort. You know, how much did they really try? I mean, post-editing, you can always just say, ah, yeah, whatever, I'll make my money, I'll just say yes to everything. But here are the different translations. Uh, so are, each one produced their own, each translator produced their own translation. Yeah. Was it, there was no convergence, there was no, one, no two people to produce No, they didn't have... You know, no. and that's that's absolutely you know, that's absolutely standard. So this is this is absolutely typical translated behavior. I don't think you find any sentence where, maybe, on a very short sentence, sometimes two people came up with the same translation, but then the other eight came up with different translations. One of the areas where you might find the difference between professional translators mm -hmm. and amateurs. If you have people who are used to working for, say, Microsoft, when we do technical yeah. documentation, we strive for standardization. Yeah, I so think yeah, for, yeah, for technical documents, I think there's a more, yeah. there are much more guidelines on how you formulate things and what tense you use, and you know, it's and it's um, and it's standardized for terminology. Uh, yes, but we're, we're going. We're getting away from sort of the really, um, yeah. very structured and, and, and dry language. But I also hear stories from someone who works at the European Parliament or European Commission with human translators, and he had this story where he just showed a translation to someone and said, like, "Oh, this is all wrong. This should be changed." And they said, "Like, no, but this was your translation from yesterday." <laughs> I still find it surprising, that despite the, the priming from the yeah. MT output. Yeah. Uh, the, the engram overlap with the second clause there is pretty strong for yeah. a number of these. So clearly yeah. that where the translator yeah. got it better, yeah. they tended to keep that. Yeah. Where the translator got it wrong, that first yeah. uh, clause there, that's where you see the biggest divergences. Yeah, yeah. So that's clear. Um, so some of them, so if you do, so that this been concise and accurate, especially if you did post editing. Oh, did they keep that? Well, has been he has been. So this is post editing. Showed himself so that's, to be concise and accurate. I mean, even there, they changed it maybe more than necessary. 
But yeah, I thought these translations. My my, my the, the one thing I wanted to stress here. I didn't think these were all that bad. But we now we get all these numbers with accuracy of fifty percent. So that's where the numbers come from. For the student, previously before doing that, yeah. kind of you know warned like don't over edit or those kind of you know. No, we were just saying just try as best as you can. You get like fix them all money to do this and never fairly well paid actually and uh, yeah try to produce good translations they may not they may not say use the tool as much as you can they may not say you know when you post edit don't just delete everything and we'll get into the behavior a bit more in detail so some people di differ drastically and some people just basically didn't use the assistance we offered they just always typed in the translation and completely ignored all the other options that were given to them so yeah on each of these sentences, well, yeah, it's, this is probably a pretty average sentence. So, you uh, average time is three, four seconds per word. So, this is a this is a ten-word sentence, roughly. So, this was done in less than a minute. So, there's no big variation between people to be unassisted and post editing. Oh, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Yeah. So, yeah, that was that. That was the main point. You know, how much faster they were these things. So, this was just yeah. This is humanly produced translations, and even that is judged hard. Pattern where the unassisted usually do better in quality than the predicted one. Yeah, I'll get to all that. Yeah, so that was actually the main point. So I'll get to that now: quality and speed, and with the assistance, without the assistance, and all that. Uh, this was just to stress uh, the metric I come up. So don't yell at me like, "Well, I only got fifty percent of sentences right." Well, this is what that fifty percent means. Um, okay. So um, yeah, this is kind of the the one way to summarize this. Um, so average speed over all translators, um, and then broken down by different kinds of con conditions. So as unassisted, 4.4 seconds, uh, with post editing 2.7 seconds, uh, given the options 3.7, uh, prediction 3.2. And both of these 3.3. So they were all faster under all these conditions. Um, so that's over like really unassisted. surprising, right? Because everyone hates post editing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the first perfect. thing you, think you get from probably have yeah. to be through this room is yeah. that, like, you know, <laughs> post editing is a pain in the neck and it slows yeah. me down and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so before you put this slide up, I would have predicted that all your other options yeah. would have been better, in fact, than yeah. post editing. Yeah, right. and you wouldn't be the only one to think that because we asked, I'll get to that at the end, but I can say it now. We asked them afterwards, what did you think was more helpful? What did you think you made me more productive? And they didn't like post-editing. <laughs> <laughs> they said, post-editing is really crap, but if you actually look at the raw numbers. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> <in> that test. <laughs> 400, so this is now, yeah, how many words are this and how many judgments are there? Yeah, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. There's another thing, you know. Yeah, just one sentence. So these are not professional translators. These are? Yeah. So they're just yeah, that's uh, an regular argument. students. They would, first of all, be not that good in terms of quality, even unassisted. Yeah. So the, the usual, the human translator would actually be much better unassisted. Okay. You know, or I, I'm actually not even concerned about the quality. I totally agree with you. I'm just looking at the speed. Oh yeah, quality by the way. So Before yeah, we put the slide speed. up, I would have predicted that the speed would be much better with the the three sort yeah. of assisted options as compared to post editing. And that but, would have made us happier too. Yeah. But so you only did 40 sentences per person, right? Yeah. And so these people were not only trying to do this task, but learn a novel yeah. user interface with oh. a lot of complication, right? So are you going to address yeah. the learning? I, I'll, I'll show 10 more slides. <coughs> uh, well, just exactly that question and what kind of people they are and all that. So yeah. OK, uh, first of all, this is another way <laughs> to break things down. Um, these are the ten all at once. <laughs> this is all at once, and I'll have a bit more breakdown of this. So this is all at once. So these are the 10 different people, and um, green are the boxes where they are faster and better with the assistance. And red is where they didn't, well, here they were, uh, this one was slower and worse. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, this is the raw number, this is the difference. Here they were slower and worse. And here, yeah, the red ones where they were slower and worse, and the white one where they improved on one but not on the other. Okay, uh, 
there's a bunch of green here, but let's just look at all these people and I kind of break down. So two people we would characterize as slow translators. So these were the slowest one to begin with, and they were also not very good. So this person here, 10% of sentences correct. So it might have actually not known uh, these languages all that well. Uh, so they improved drastically. So they have, if someone doesn't know, uh, doesn't know how to translate very well, either because they don't know the source language or the target language very well, they're, they're greatly helped by this tool. Uh, these are people who were not as slow as the previous ones, but still rather slow, and they definitely got faster, but not necessarily better. But they were around 50% to begin with. So that's not much change. But, so they were faster, but not necessarily better. Um, two of them uh, were fast translators to begin with, and they got even faster and better. Um, we had four people <laughs> labeled as refusing, who just, uh, we have the keystroke lock, we knew what they were doing, and they never pressed tab, they never accepted any of the predictions, they never clicked on any of the options, they might have looked at them, we don't know that, but <laughs> they just didn't use the assistance. So it's not a total surprise that the assistance didn't help them. So these are the people where they actually, if you look at the logs, they were the same speed with post prediction and with options and with an assistant because they just didn't use them. So the only thing they couldn't get away from was the post editing because when they opened the sentence, it was already in the text box. <laughs> So at least they had to do something about it. Um, maybe delete it in one big go. But if you look at the breakdown of numbers, they didn't do that, at least not always. Um, and they got, uh, so all the arrows point down, so they all got faster. So even these people who were not totally convinced by all this newfangled technology and might have also not liked the post-editing all that much, got faster with post-editing. Quality kind of. Yeah, and yeah, this is kind of this is a this is a champion translator here. So this was one highest percent right, was the fastest, or was it the firstest? But one of the fastest for sure. And error goes in the right direction. And, and so were these um, were these options presented in random order? Like the, the yeah. they were given. Um, so they, they worked on one block at a time. So post editing, or so sorry. But, yeah. Translation from scratch yeah. followed by post editing followed by because they may have gotten acclimatized to the task and there's yeah. good and free. But yeah, so they were not given any specific. Yeah, so the way it was presented to them in the tool, <laughs> they would have. They were not forced to do it in the same order as we presented to them. So they had like a list of do this task or this task, this task. The order was kind of mixed up for the different people, um, but they did one condition all the way through. So they translated entire news story under one condition, and then they went to the next news story and had maybe a different condition or the same condition. So it wasn't completely randomized, but. Um, okay. Um, so we have some more uh, analysis on this, um, answering some of your questions. Um, we did this, of course, because we have this keystroke lock, and this is now one, one person who did the sentence prediction. So we have now a new color, red. Red is pressing the tab key, uh, accepting the prediction of the MT system. And, uh, and this is a somewhat uh, representative way of one way to use this prediction. So you kind of do post-editing MT, but you do it in a way that you produce the sentence as you read it. And only when you then don't like something anymore. So you just, up to here, it's exactly the one best translation of the MT system that was just kind of read through. And at this point, the person was like, oh, okay, 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 something went wrong, I don't like this. So there's some deletions, adding of letters, a lot of moving around here, you know, deleting, adding, and so on. Then a pause, and then the, to the tool kind of makes new suggestions and the person kind of accepts them all, maybe even until the end of the sentence, and then does a revision on that part as well. So it's kind of doing post-editing, but it's a bit more interactive since the user controls what kind of pops up in the, in the text area. And, and certainly this continuation here might be better than what was in the original MT output. Well, it'd be definitely better suited. Okay. Um, so, um, so this is how um, 
um, how much time they spend on these different uh, um, activities. This is now just for one user, so not averaged over everything. So what do we highlight here? Um, this is how much time they originally spent on typing. So this, of course, goes down when you don't have to type everything anymore, especially in post-editing where you have to type less, or even here in prediction. And how much time was spent on the other activities. So a slightly less, so there's one, I mean, is, is, is the time-consuming part of in translating actually typing in the translation. So we reduced that time a bit. Um, but the biggest difference is that this time spent on pauses went down quite a lot. So um, yeah, it reduced all these pauses, especially the big pauses. So this was the one that spent like two seconds on very long pauses. And that just didn't happen afterwards anymore. Um, OK, this is uh, another one. What was So that person didn't really use the assistance all that much. So did spend less time on tabbing and clicking. And I'm not sure if I show that, but you can also look at where did the characters come from in the final translation? Did they come from any of these prediction activities or the original MT? Or did they, where they're typed in? So you can look at that too. And in this case here, when both of these options were given, actually never clicked and never pressed tab. So no time spent on this at all. So only in post-editing person was used, was kind of forced to use the tool, spent dramatically less time on typing. Not totally surprising, I guess. Spent a bit more time here on these pauses. So you have to read chunks at a time. So this pauses between 6 and 60 seconds. So you have to read maybe for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, something that shows up here. So overall, slightly faster in this per for this person. Um, yeah, this is what I just alluded to. So uh, this is actually then a reflection, where did the characters come from? So if you just kind of follow up all these typing events and tapping events and clicking events, you can actually track each character in the final translation and figure out where did this character come from? Was that character typed in? Was that character generated by clicking on one of the options? Uh, did it come from the original MT and so on? So in post-editing, this person changed 18% of the characters. And that includes deleting something and typing exactly the same thing again. And he see where, where the other characters come from. So uh, the ones typed in were the highest here and uh, also relatively low for the other things. OK, this is the second one who just, yeah, we know he didn't use these options. 100% of the characters were typed in. And also for these. Uh, when these options were given, uh, these types of assistance were given, yeah, use them only partially. Um, yeah, this is this weird pause graph. Maybe I should just <laughs> ignore that. Um, here, this is the question you had: learning curve. So when they used, so we didn't have a training phase, um, but they used it continuously for over 40 s sentences, which is not a huge training period. So they used maybe spent like an hour or so. I should figure out the math exactly, but they probably spent an hour or so on each yeah, of these conditions. Also fascinating because you would think that the learning curve would be more for the prediction and the options, because there is actually something yeah. there to learn. That like, hey, yeah. I've got these options, I'm yeah, predicting, yeah. So, so but the things. learning curve is actually better for post-editing. I mean, because there's yeah. where so there's sort the of at least you would think that there's yeah. the least to learn there. Yeah. So, <laughs> unless they've learned over time that, that if they do nothing, they can get a job over with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but no, Lee's point. No, about you this. learn. You learn what kind of mistakes the system makes, and then it's very easy oh, for so you, you to predict. Adapt. For example, yeah. if he inserts articles, deletes articles, yeah. very easy for you to. Yeah. But in terms of the tool, yeah. Yeah. there is actually something there to learn in the tool. I mean, you're kind of yeah. learning that, you know, what tab does, there's some suggestion, yeah. there's some stuff, yeah. there's some clicking. So that's, that's clearly at the beginning, you know, in the sure. first five sentences, also, there's a dramatic, the they find it. Yeah. Right. So, so, so the so the big thing you also sort of explain. So what what kind of drops out of here is that if you translate a story, mm -hmm. maybe 
the first sentence just takes longer because you're just not in the mindset of the story and it takes you longer to figure out. And then three sentences later, vocabulary repeats itself. Um, so these were multiple stories, but it doesn't, but they had different lengths. So there's no like a middle bump because <laughs> after 20 seconds, the next story starts because the stories all have different lengths. So. What about the collection at the end there for the, the middle? <laughs> People just getting bored and spending <laughs> 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 I don't know. So the, I cut it off here because the shortest kind of aggregated story length was 31. But it kind of keeps. No, these are. So they translated 40 sentences under each condition, but these might have been multiple stories. And they were different stories. So it, was, it wasn't always exactly 40, it was sometimes 45 and sometimes 32. So yeah, apparently 32 was the absolute minimum. A block of stories was long. So these curves go a little bit longer. Do they keep, do they but then I don't have 10 flat. numbers anymore to divide through. Do they, do they stay sort of flat or do they continue? That's a good question and we should do more work. So we should probably do a proper study how this actually with a proper training phase and, and all these things. So that's a, so this is just some, some glimpse on. Uh, I think the important, the one thing I learned from this is that this year didn't really change all that much. So the unassisted, yes, you have to maybe, at the beginning of a story, you're slower. So you drop from six seconds to four seconds. But then you kind of stay there. While with the assistance, yeah, at the beginning you were not that much different, but then it kind of keeps going down. So there's a, there's a training effect that if you would do this, maybe all numbers look m more optimistic than, than what I presented. And yeah, usually they should be better trained and so on. Okay, um, I already talked about this user feedback. We asked them, very quick questionnaire, in which of the five conditions did you think you were the most accurate? And they didn't. Yeah, I liked all our stuff. It didn't say unassisted anywhere there, so <laughs> it didn't say like all, all your tool was just distracting me from the right answers. And and rank them on a scale to one to five by what you thought was most helpful. And uh, yeah, that didn't fare so well. And that is a doesn't match the empirical results. So the, the, I mean, this is a pretty clearly, uh, the first one you could still like argue about what does that mean accurate, but the system, like what did you think was most helpful? At least when we define the goal of the study, produce translations fast, produce good translations fast, the answer would have been um, post-editing, but if we ask them, what do you but think? If you're talking about volunteer communities and all that, the goal is yeah. to produce the maximum number of translations. Isn't that so, the same thing? No, because like if people, if you, if your tool is annoying enough that people drop out, yeah. then that's a good point. So that's a really, really good point. So this is, so just to give you like a, an actual fact in that space. So if you do simultaneous translation from speech, you do that for 15 minutes and then you have a break for 15 minutes or so, because it's just too stressful. So you can't keep doing this. So. Uh, maybe this post editing is just much more stressful that if you do it for half an hour, you're just really, you know, gonna take half an hour break. And this is not something we measure because <laughs> they could stop at any time. You just always measure time on a, on a single sentence. So if you turned off <coughs> the browser and just went back an hour later, we didn't know that. So, and that probably requires a bit more study on yeah, cognitive load and maybe it's more annoying and so on. So, you, Presented with something that you are forced to edit right away, mm -hmm. that that is far I don't know less user friendly yeah. than you actually get options so that you yeah. can customize it on the fly. Yeah, and that totally reflects my experience with it. It's just much more fun to build the translation. Even if you just do this tapping, where you actually kind of do post editing, but you have full control over what pops up in your text area, and you're not just just confronted with these thirty word junk. <laughs> that you have to go over. It's a very, very different mindset of doing this task. One is like you feel like you're creative, you have to build a sentence, you kind of weigh nuances. And the other one, you're just basically fixing some other people's mess. And it's not even some other people's, it's some machine's mess. So you make, made a good point about sentence length. Right? Yeah. So that made, made the 
which option works best may vary drastically by sentence length. Okay, wow. Well, yeah. Because um, like really long well, sentences, yeah. post-editing might yeah. be much yeah. harder than yeah. shorter sentences, yeah. just because it's yeah. worse quality to start. So you could, you could figure that out. Um, the prediction stuff works less and less well with longer and longer sentences due to the technical problem of having to match the user prefix to the search graph. If you have too many edits, then the search for finding the minimal edit and pass is getting actually too slow to be used. Yeah, yeah. So the string edit distance is not the right metric really to do this because it doesn't count properly for moves. But then if you do anything else, it, the computational problem of matching. So if you use something like TER, what is the minimum TER edit cost? of a 20-word prefix to a big search graph. This is sort of orthogonal, but you can incrementally compute some of these things and just, yeah. I mean, if you look at infor instead of TER, you can store around your dynamic programming chart and do some of this stuff. Yeah, 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 so that's, yeah, I haven't talked about the algorithm, so yeah, it does obviously do incremental uh, dynamic programming, but it's actually, it's still, I'm not totally, it's for the phrase base, it works. So the one thing I'm currently struggling with, do the same thing for a tree-based model where you have a forest and you have to match user input on the string edit distance against the forest. It's not a, not a, not a trivial problem. And it's still not as fast generally as, as I would want it to be. So it takes, even, this is implemented in C, so it has to be fast. Yeah, yeah, basically that's kind of what you have to do. But yeah, if you have any views on that, <laughs> I can show you where I am. Any faster, really, than, than forced decoding. Yeah, yeah. At some point, really, the, you should just do redecode the sentence yeah. with forced decoding. Decode. Yeah. Then you would actually then the graph matching would be easier. Yeah. So for long sentence, we should do that. But that's kind of just from the machinery of setting this up. You know, it gets trickier. Yeah. Okay. Sorry if I misunderstood, but can you populate the prediction simply with the next word from the? With, Instead of showing the yeah. post-edited, just yeah. always show, you don't c compute the minimal path, but you just show the next word that the machine would translate at that point. Yeah. Just take the post-edited. Well, that, that is the suggestion. That's what the suggestion is. But you know what the suggestion is. This. Has to. But you're talking about finding the paths, but just like um, well, how to know what the next word so, is. That's, that's the answer. Oh, okay, so we do this here, um, meeting. Um, so it has to match Sarkozy meeting just yeah. getting the machine translation yeah. once, yeah. and then just kind of you know showing the next word, so that you're effectively yeah. post-editing, but you're yeah. You select. So Lucy, I think the issue is that if you yeah. look at the empty output here, it says Sarkozy at the meeting of Fisherman Angry, right. and so if I said Sarkozy at the at the yes. meeting of okay. Angry, then it would say the next word would be Angry, Maybe Angry, yes. Angry, Angry. So, right. Right. so yeah. if it, if we're a monotone problem and not a reordered problem, you're right. Then, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, well, that's uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. So going, back, going back to your other slide that you were on for user feedback, did you distinguish uh, French language speakers from English language? I would um, think that the options would be different among students who are native and who are non native. Could be. I'm not sure if I. So it's all reported in a journal paper. We might have broken it down, maybe not. But then it's also a relatively small sample if you go down to that level because. Yeah. Here it's ten people. You average over after five, so it's really just individuals. And any any statistical significance flies out of the window. Okay, um, so we have twelve minutes left. Um, <laughs> as I promised, I get to the first one third of the talk, and I think I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> so let me just summarize this. Uh, it's basically just what I what we already discussed. So people got faster under all the conditions. We especially reduced the big pauses. We uh, reduced a little bit the typing effort in post editing for sure. Um, they made them slightly better, although I don't want to make any big claims about quality because I'm not happy about <laughs> human judgment on this. And uh, I blame the judges. Um, even the good translators got better with the post editing. I think that's somewhat good news. Um, uh, some of the good translators, so we had four refuse nicks who just didn't use the tool. Um, that's a general problem. If you give people a tool and they use the one way of working it, that why would they actually change the way they work? And uh, and they were the fastest and to some degree also the best with post editing, but they didn't like it. So now there are two ways to go from here. One is 
to make our assistants better, so they catch up with post-editing, or to make post-editing more fun. So we're trying both of these things. Um, so the various ways I could improve post-editing. Yeah. What is the goal? Because if the goal is to get, uh, do you have a better way to assess the quality? Because in the end, in this experiment, what you got was not con was content that was not necessarily usable, right? Because it's barely passes fifty percent acceptance rate. If that's an acceptance yeah, rate, yeah, right? yeah, so yeah, if the goal yeah. is translating, I don't yeah. know. They were not good to I think start the 50% number is too low for uh, honest assessment. I think they're being too harsh. They were too harsh. I, that's my take. Translate us too harsh. But it's always easy to find a mistake in a translation, I think. But you could change the question, though, too. I think that yeah. it's hard yeah, to find. You could use a, a wonderful scale. Yeah, yeah, there's that yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's still, yeah, you always can. But then you have an even meaningless you can number. You blue score against the other nine translations. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, I truly believe that they're going to say 90% is fine, and here just the person was too lazy or didn't pay attention or just didn't know the language well, well. But otherwise, why would they actually get, you know, anything wrong? They're human translators. They're perfect. Isn't that all goal? Worse than humans. Well, we see really bad. Yeah, yeah. Like there was a NIST test set where like translator three was consistently oh, horrible yeah. on oh, yeah. every yeah. single yeah. sentence. Out of four yeah. references, yeah. it's consistent. Yeah. 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 Uh, did you measure the uh, effectiveness of post editing for different MD quality? Like if you have better news translator? Uh, so, this was just one system. We just, yeah, that's a variable. Um, and it does matter a lot. Um, so, I know from that one of the translation agencies we work with, they offer or they do post editing MT for French and for Spanish, but they don't do it for German because the quality of the MT engines for German is not as good. So, the quality definitely better. So, there's one point in the quality curve of MT where it becomes good enough for post-editing. And that's very, and we reached that point for several language pairs, especially with restricted domain. So that's kind of good news for MT. You have a real <laughs> use for people in industry use post-editing MT and they get better results and they're faster and so on. But we haven't reached that point for all language pairs and we don't necessarily have it for all the domains that people want to translate stuff. Do you think people should push more for quality and use regular post editing, or use better interface, yeah. better interaction? Yeah, so we do both. Um, so we actually, we have, since I said we, have, we applied for too much funding, and in this case, we got too much because we <laughs> 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 and, and and one is one is kind of run mostly by this translation agency that. Says, yeah, don't all this funny stuff you're gonna put on the screen. It's just gonna annoy translators. We, they're not gonna, <laughs> they don't like this. They wanna, you know, at most post editing MT. That's all. They, you know, they're used to translation memories. We give them now one additional option, which is MT, and maybe hide it that it's MT. <laughs> and and that's all we're gonna give to them. We're not gonna throw kind of funny colored stuff on the screen. Um, so they are the main focus is like uh, also like how can you improve MT. Um, like incremental training, those kind of ideas, and maybe show some things, use confidence measures to not throw the, show them bad MT or word level confidence, highlighting words that are more likely to be wrong. Translators is going to be a completely different feedback. Yeah. So that's why the agencies are hesitant. Yeah, yeah. And because yeah, it's proposed for unassisted uh, translation, translators tend to read the sentence and they already have an idea mm -hmm. how to translate it. It takes yeah. very you know, few seconds to come yeah. up with something compared to a usual student who actually is not used to that exercise, doing that yeah. exercise all over and over every yeah. day. So if you compare that with MT, you know, it's gonna, in most cases it's going to slow them down because they have to revise somebody else's uh, translation. Which for human translation, the translator is a longer process than yeah. coming up with system. Yeah. So there certainly is some high bar for the MT to pass, otherwise it's completely useless. So if it's just like 50% of the sentences is just rubbish, then you slow down the translator so much by looking at all that rubbish. So it has to be good enough that for the sentences you show, the vast majority should be helpful, otherwise it's just a waste of time. And yeah, that, I mean, there are studies around, people tried it, and it obviously differs a lot by language pair and task, but um, like the few ones one I know is, for instance, from Autodesk, where they say people get 50% faster or 80% faster, depending on language pair. So 
this is MT engines that are geared towards their data. They are trained on their data and used on their data. And so these are kind of, yeah. So the numbers you, you actually get reported back from translations is maybe 20% faster or 50% faster. It's not like three or four or 10 times faster. There's also a, a human element apart from all of the technology yeah, discussion. Yeah. You know, there's a potentially disruptive technology coming into what you have been doing manually forever. Mm -hmm. And some people will resist it. You have Luddites, you know, you have mm -hmm. refuse snakes. So that also, yeah, that yeah. also comes into yeah. equation apart from the, how, how good the technology is how you onboard the people who actually use it to mm -hmm. make it, um, you make them amenable to use the technology. Yeah. Yeah. About 10 years ago, the same process was uh, when uh, happened with translators yeah. needed to start using translation tools, yeah. uh, computer-aided translation tools, which are memory yeah. recycling tools. So many people had trouble in actually getting on board with that. Now everybody more or less is on board with uh, mm -hmm. translating using yeah. those I mean, tools. Yes. And some of them actually provide MT suggestions. Many of them. Yeah, so that I think is addressing that hidden repackaging yeah. <laughs> of the suggestions. Yeah, so it's a, I mean, translators, it's a very, very diverse group of people, so I don't know how much you know from the EMTA conference, there was one of the keynote speech was given because previously they were co-located with the translators organization. So you have the translators and then the machine translation, so it's a <laughs> neck to neck. Yeah, so the ones that actually go to EMTA are probably open-minded. If you want to talk at the, at the translators conference, then I've been only once in a one that was majority translators and it was more hostile. <laughs> The most hostile audience I ever had. So but what was the, the next part of the talk? Know, I oh, yeah, don't have just, time to get through it. But yeah, we're not going to do it. I'm just going to quickly, oh, maybe that's worth going it. Um, the monolingual translation. Yeah, I was, yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, let's just do So let's do the monolingual translation. So the idea was, okay, the idea is basically, yeah, straightforward. If the key system produces the girl entered into a room, you can figure out what it means, you can fix it. So you don't even need to know the source language. You don't need, it's just, you know, what makes sense in the target. Uh, and here is the... No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, especially with, with statistical yeah. machine translation, yeah. you produce something fluent, you, but totally yeah, unrelated. Yeah. So, so accuracy is a yeah. So you, the, the, yeah. the quality is, is different. Then, yeah, yeah. Quality metric you don't expect to match human translators, mm -hmm. honestly, or what professional bilingual translators would something like this. Okay, here's the task. That's a pretty picture. Um, here. So, this is how we set that up. Um, this is the one that you can read, and I'll show you the one you can read. So this is the Arabic sentence. We did it again with people in Edinburgh, student staff, people uh, don't know any Arabic. Uh, squiggly symbols. It helped a bit probably to see if these are long words or short words, but that's about it. 2008, it obviously helped that you could <laughs> figure out what that was supposed to mean. So this is here the part. Can you figure out from that the translation? So step one is you just do post-editing T. Step two is you do this. And this was, yeah, not that much better as we would have hoped. There was like one story where it clearly helped people, but otherwise we'd have mixed back. Space, you know, you have a lot of context in your head. You yeah. know what's going on. So this is world. just your world yes. knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one big thing we found out, it matters a lot. Oh, well, found out. It was pretty obvious. <laughs> The more you know about something, the better you do. So there was one sports story about an American soccer player playing in the Copa America. If you know anything about soccer and you know this tournament and how it works and how they play, and uh, you did much, much better than someone who just, you know, playing against Colombia. What does that mean? Is it a good thing? <laughs> I'd expect it. Would what is the scenario for a monolingual translator? To me, that sounds like an oxymoron. It's a, it's a very oxymoron. I think there's actually a real, I mean, there is this kind of whole DARPA scenario of the analyst who wants to find out about some foreign document text. So you can give them a machine translation, or you can give them this. Maybe they figure out more about the text with this. Um, so well, they act. Like a whole publication scenario, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, if you want to translate Wikipedia into a, yeah. a into a new language, yeah. and you have a bunch of speakers of that language, but well, not well. not bilingual, then yeah. Yeah. Uh, if they can fix it up to readable quality, but yeah. you cannot. But, there, but there's there's also the the crisis scenario too. So yeah. I mean, uh, 
the example in Haiti yeah. where you know to triage, yeah. you're not going to triage in Creole because no one speaks the language. They're yeah. going to need to triage. I mean, no one yeah. who's provided aid spoke the language. You yeah. need to triage in, a, in, in another language. And yeah. so being able to get it in the language in the form of the baby. Can you really get it? You don't speak the native. Uh, good enough to triage. Good question. Uh, yeah, so the, the, this is the numbers you got out of it. Uh, yeah, I think these are the highlights. So this is broken down for the different stories. So this is the bilingual translator. And there was huge variety also in the different translators. Maybe I should show that too. These are the different, uh, do I have that? These are the different people fared. And some didn't do very well. And some did really well. And this person, for instance, did really well. This is on Arabic stories and Chinese stories. This is the bilingual translators. I think you kind of reference this. There's one bad bilingual translator. This is a NIST test set. So we had three bilingual translators and a reference. So we actually could pretend these were independently, I mean, they were independently translated and we could score them. So there was one bad bilingual translator and three of the monolingual translators <laughs> were as good as them. Um, so there's a huge variety. So if you're now average over all these people, you might you know, that's good. And this is now average over the stories for these different translators. So there's this one where the showing the options instead of just doing post-editing of MT helped. But for the other ones, it didn't matter that much. There's one story here. You average across the different Tr people. The yeah. yeah, this is now, these numbers here are average over these 10 monolingual translators who are all the same kind of people and all didn't know the source language. And they all translated the same stories. And this is average over the three bilingual translators, which is the NIST sentences. And the same metric saying, is it correct or not based on the reference translation? So, so the real question is, is there a way to uh, bias the uh, machine translation system in a way to assist a monolingual uh, yeah. post editor? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because obviously right now they're doing much worse than yeah. people who are doing yeah. So there's some obvious things that are kind of jump out. Uh, names. If I mean, if they're not translated right, there's just no way. F I mean, there's hardly any way for a human to catch get out, get that right. But even still, your I mean, yeah. the air bars here within statistical significance in a kind of. Oh, that's a good. Well, that's a good argument. I just <laughs> two data points in our basket. I'm just talking about an example yeah. of these cases. Yeah, yeah. So it's not. It's yeah. It's not. And it works. I mean, I, I, I can show this in the tool too if you want to play around with this. It's actually already twelve, but so if you uh, now I can't go back. Or how does this work? Anyway, uh, so it's it's fun to do this. Um, we did something like this like very early on at ISI, like 15 years ago. Just give them like the output of MT or phrase tables. Can you figure out what the stories are? And, and it, just knowing what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. If you get like five content words, you can kind of puzzle it together. I mean, you can, yeah, you might be completely wrong. <laughs> 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 you might be completely wrong. You might miss the knot. <laughs> you would focus the empty system on different things. Yeah. For example, you pay very close attention to whether you're getting the negation right. Yeah. Um, you pay close the attention on the name density, yeah. right? Yeah. You, don't you don't care about the alarm at all. Uh, what? You don't care about the what? You don't care about the alarm so much because yeah, you don't the, care the your monolingual right. readers can do the... Yeah. As long as they, as long as they can... If you look at this here... Yeah, close enough yeah. that it's not complete word yeah. salad because otherwise you're not going to make it. Sure. Sense. Yeah. I mean, here there's no language model. So if you just put this together, it doesn't even... You can figure out what fits together. So you, the human language model is much better than an engram language model from a phrase space. You have the right word sense. You don't need a language model at all. Right? Yeah. Like you, or you don't need a language model to produce this. Yeah. If you, yeah, have, so you would pay you attention the word to sense. Sense dis contextual sense disambiguation because yeah. if you pick the wrong sense, yeah. there's no way. Yeah. I, well, you need a lot of word knowledge to know that it's not the right. Yeah. So negation, word sense, uh, payment yeah. of data, stuff like that. Could, yeah. Can you we're, model the human, uh, the uh, one's background knowledge, yeah. your, your common sense knowledge, by find for this Arabic news article, can, is there technology to find a, a comparable America, uh, U.S. English news article? Have oh. the translator read that. Yeah. Now, now use the options. That's like a kind of triage in a way. Because yeah. now you yeah. can. Yeah. Now it's you like, can. It's like priming with relevant yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So now you know that, you know, kind of who does what to you who, know the and then you, yeah. yeah. Instead of yeah. but, uh, so the typical the scenario where this is used, the user knows the content. I mean, he cares about the content. Why else would they right. do this? Scenario, yeah. So this, other scenarios. Yeah. It's something if by finding the comparable sources and yeah. having the monolingual translator read those, you can kind of control for how much one translator knows versus yeah. the other. But yeah. you're not, yeah. In this case, you're not really a translator. No, it's you're both edited. So you're not even interested in post-editing. You want to understand, is this something like in the DARPA context? Yeah. You're listening to the signal. Yes. Most of it is noise. Do I want to invest in a professional translator for this particular yeah. communication that could be interesting where I see something? Yeah. You're not really embellishing the output. You're really yeah. it, it, it varies how much detail you're interested in. If the one question is, could I give this a professional translator? Yes, no. Then the quality level doesn't have to be all that high. But if you want to find out when the bomb is going to explode and all you have this handwritten scribbled <laughs> thing and the clock is ticking and <laughs> uh, you you want to know more detail. You don't really care about the, the final translation. All you want yeah. to know is understanding yeah. the context and you know this is yeah. beautiful because yeah. you know you can go through the content and get an idea of what yeah. it yeah. tells you but you're and not going to spend yeah. your time. Yeah and you get some sense of I don't know this is probably not a good example but about the very like the uncertainty of certain things. Um, like there was a subway, there was something about like Muslim brother, brotherhood story in Egypt about the group and the word abortion came up. So it doesn't, it clearly didn't mean the general word understanding what abortion means. It was like kind of the abolition of the group. And you could figure it out because it was about the government and then the abortion of the group. And like, yeah, that means they want to ban the group. And, uh, not, in, in this sense, uh, how much is religion different from just a dictionary and a Facebook? Well, it ranks these things. Um, that's, and yeah, it, it, yeah, it has a probabilistic way of ranking them, basically. But it's, yeah, it's a probabilistic dictionary on a phrasal level. But it doesn't use a sentence context, so it doesn't really do... The way we do this, it doesn't use a sentence context. You could do it in a way that it uses a sentence context. Yeah. We should, uh, we should. Yeah. fill up your... Uh, we already lost, lost half of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay.